with the world in such a disastrous state, why did the Lord Jesus Christ decide to come down and enter into all this, into all the suffering, into all the mess? He became a human being that he might lead human beings to glory. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And Jonathan, as you point out, we have a world that was in such a disastrous mess, but why was it so important for Jesus to come as a human being to deal with that? I mean, being God, what was so significant about him taking on human form and becoming a human? Well, that's the huge question that Hebrews is addressing here in this in this section that we're going to be looking at today. But it is such a vital question to consider. And as we look at what Hebrews is doing, we discover that he's taking us right back to God's creation purpose for humanity. And what he's wanting to show us is that God's original dream for humanity, God's original creation intention for humanity, he hasn't given up on it. Despite the fall, despite everything that's happened, God still has a grand plan for humanity. But in order for that plan to be fulfilled, what we discover in the gospel and what Hebrew shows us, what we discover is that Jesus needed to enter into humanity to do the job for us to fulfill the glorious calling of humanity, and then to redeem men and women who could join him in that glorious plan. And Hebrews is going to open that up for us in a very, very exciting way. Well, if you've never taken a look at this subject matter before, I think you're going to be uh, encouraged today. So grab a Bible and join us in the book of Hebrews. We're uh, picking up in chapter 2, verse 5, going through the first few verses of Hebrews 3, as we continue a message entitled, leading many to glory. Here is Jonathan. Verse 14 is, I think, an amazing verse. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. One of our kids at home had a nasty fall this week, and we spent a few hours in the hospital as a, as a result. When it, when it happened, it was a little startling for us and for him. You know, pretty good gash on the face, lots of blood everywhere and all that kind of thing, not a very pleasant thing. But when that happens, as it does from time to time with little kids, you're reminded as a parent of their fragility. That that was the thing that came home for us. I mean, they bounce around all the time and they get knocks and bruises and they're full of vitality. But then when a more visible injury comes along, you remember that although they're young and they're strong, they're also fragile their flesh, and their blood. They're vulnerable. Now, Hebrews wants us to see that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped into our fragility, the fragility of the children of humanity, verse 14. He took on and embraced all that fragility, and He did so that He might defeat our great enemy. And how was he going to defeat death and the devil? It was, end of verse 14, through death itself. The Bible tells us, doesn't it, that the wages of sin is death. And the bottom line within the judgment of God and the accounting of God, the bottom line is this, either we will die for our sin or someone else dies for us. But the wages must be paid. And so as he came to save us, Jesus came to pay that price for us. But in order to pay it, in order to die, here is the crucial thing that we need to grasp from Hebrews 2. He had to become a human being. Just think about that for a moment. The eternal God in His divinity, He cannot die. The eternal God, He lives forever. He never changes. And so for the eternal God to save us from death, through death, He had to take on humanity in the person of His Son. He had to become a human being. He needed a genuine humanity that he could truly die. And so Jesus, the Son of God, took on these things that he might defeat the devil, undo his ghastly work, and verse 15, deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Discussion about spiritual things, about truth, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Discussion of those things with the skeptical world around us can often descend and get bogged down in obscure argument and debate. 
And people who view themselves as sophisticated can often sneer at the offer of life through the gospel. But beneath any veneer of cleverness or of self-sufficiency, the basic reality is actually this. We are surrounded by people who are terrified of dying. Fallen humanity lives in slavery to the fear of death. That's the great psychological insight of verse 15. Now, that slavery, it may express itself through sheer avoidance of the subject. I think that's the main response. Through denial, through the endless pursuit of health and well-being, through this desperate attempt to cheat the grave even if for a few more years, but people are scared. And if you're here as an unbeliever, I'm pretty sure that deep down you're scared too. And you should be scared. Death is a fearful reality. But Jesus Christ, He came to release us from that fear. He came to release us because He's paid the price. He's plumbed the depths of the grave itself. He has died so that death for us might no longer be the final enemy. That death for those who turn to Him and trust in Him might actually now be the door to life. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus had to come low in humanity in suffering, in death, and He had to do that to defeat death itself. And thirdly, He had to come low in humanity that He might become our high priest. I was very interested the other day to see in a magazine that the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States, they've started advertising openly for recruits. I, I think that's a new thing. I sense that it used to be a matter of a kind of quiet tap and a shoulder in a dark alleyway from a guy wearing a trench coat and a hat. You know, that's how they used to recruit. Uh, but now they advertise in, in magazines, and their latest ad, it says the following. For the intellectually curious adventurer looking for an unparalleled, high-impact international opportunity, we offer a way of life that challenges the deepest resources of an individual's intellect, resilience, and judgment. Well, the ad is a little bit cagey. Uh, to say too much more about the kind of skills and the qualifications that they're looking for and they will require for the job. But, but we know as we read that and we hear those words that they're going to have incredibly high standards and strict requirements for anyone who would come and work with them, join their number and participate in their very sensitive activities. G to get in, you know you're going to need languages. You're going to need analytical skills. You're going to need problem-solving abilities. You're going to need psychological insight, resilience, and a whole host of other things. After all, the nation's security are going to be on your very shoulders. Within the people of God, there can hardly be a more significant and a more sensitive role than the job of the high priest, the one who mediates between God and man, representing God before the people and the people before God. Well, what are the requirements of the job? What are the basic qualifications? Well, there are many, and Hebrews is going to spend some time later on in the letter actually outlining them. But here is the basic one and the absolute essential. The high priest for the people of God must be a true human being. A true human being who has suffered trial as a human. Verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, He's able to help those who are being tempted. If Jesus was going to be faithful and merciful in the job of high priest, he needed to know something of the reality of human life, life in a world of suffering and of sin. He needed to know what it was like to come under trial, to face opposition, to undergo the attacks of the evil one, to suffer physically, even to die. He had to become like us. Now, as a side note, it's worth just noting here that the word tempted in verse 18 there, in its original, it's the same word that can be translated tested. That same word, depending on context, can be translated tempted or tested. And I tend to think that the emphasis here is actually on the testing that Jesus endured as He faced the cross. As He, as he went to do the thing mentioned in the previous verse to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Here, his loyalty and his obedience to the Father, they're tested severely. Would he remain faithful through it all? And as he was sorely tested, he suffered very deeply. 
And because of this experience, he's able to help those who are being tested and who are being tried, who are going through that experience of very deep suffering. As a pastor, I have this privilege of meeting with people at, often at crucial points in their lives, of, often at times of suffering or trial or deep difficulty. And sometimes there will be an occasion where someone's going through something, and, and I've kind of been there myself, and, and I can speak from some real personal experience. But then on other occasions, a person or a couple or a family they share with me a trial that they're, they're facing, a valley of suffering or, or grief that they're going through. And I, I feel for them, and I want to be there for them, and I want to support them, I want to help, but I know that I am limited in meeting them in that time because I haven't gone through anything quite like that myself. I frankly haven't faced the depths of suffering that they have faced, and I'm just aware of my limitations in that. But the wonderful thing about Jesus, our high priest, is that he has plumbed the very depths of human suffering. Not that he has faced every single type of suffering in exactly the same way as we might face it, but in the sense that there is no human suffering that we can ever look at and say, you know, this goes farther and this goes deeper than the suffering of Jesus Christ at the cross. We can never say that. At the cross, he took on himself the sin of the guilty, of countless guilty sinners, and he faced not only the physical agony of the worst execution the Romans could come up with, but he faced the very judgment of God. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a message called Leading Many to Glory as we continue to look at what it meant for Jesus to become human. Hope you'll stay with us. We're going to get back to this message in just a little bit. But this message is from a series where we're taking a look at the book of Hebrews. It's called So Great a Salvation. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of Jonathan's teaching, I want you to know you can always come to the website and you can listen online. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. And when you're at the website, I want to ask you to consider giving a gift of support because we're able to bring you Jonathan's teaching on this station because of your generosity. And as our way of saying thanks for your gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book written by J.C. Ryle that Jonathan highly recommends. It's called Daily Readings from All Four Gospels. It'll take you through a, a wonderful exploration of the Gospels in a year. One easy, consumable reading at a time. Again, we'd love to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thanks for your support. If you want to give online right now, you can do that by coming to EncounterTheTruth.org or stay tuned. We'll have a little more information about this later in the broadcast. Right now, let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. For many, I think the real sticking point in trusting in Jesus and turning to Jesus, the real sticking point actually is this question of suffering. How can a loving God look on unmoved while his creatures suffer? But verse 18, it shatters that objection, doesn't it, as we think about it? We may still have all kinds of questions about the problem of human suffering, but we can hardly say that God has stayed on the sidelines, that God doesn't care that God doesn't understand. No, not at all. In the person of His Son, He has come down. He has entered into human suffering. He has plumbed its very depths. And because He has done that, the Lord Jesus Christ is qualified, supremely qualified, fully qualified to be our high priest, to be our representative, the representative of a suffering and a groaning humanity before a compassionate God. He's qualified for that. It may be today that you're going through a time of very deep trial, and your sense is actually that no one else can understand. You, you may be keeping it quite quiet, quite private for that very reason. It's a pain that you are bearing alone because you, you sense that no one else could fully appreciate it. Sharing it with someone else who fails to understand, it's only actually going to make it worse. It's only going to hurt more. But you see, Jesus has suffered profoundly. He suffered profoundly when He went through that deepest trial. He suffered as He bore the insults of His enemies, the betrayal of His friends, the agony of the cross. He suffered as He faced the very judgment of God. And so Jesus Christ, He is the one person that we can feel utterly confident in bringing our suffering to. The, the one person who will understand as we undergo trial, as we suffer pain, He is qualified. He's truly qualified to be our great high priest. 
As high priest, he sympathizes, he understands. But there is more to the job of being high priest than simply being a sympathetic ear for us. The high priest, you see, was required to bring the offering to address the sin of the people. He had to bring the sacrifice. And this too, Jesus did to perfect effect. Verse 17 again. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. To propitiate is to address, to satisfy, and to turn away anger. And for Jesus, our high priest, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, it means that he gave an offering that fully addresses the just and the righteous anger of God at the wrongdoing of the people. In the Old Testament, the priest brought animal offerings to do that very thing. But they were never fully effective. They were symbols. They were placeholders in anticipation of the truly effective offering to come. But now this high priest, he brought not an animal but himself. And as the Son of God presented Himself to the Father as a blameless and a pure sacrifice for sin, a sacrifice of infinite worth, as He gave Himself to die for the sins of the people, He was able to be that true and effective, that final propitiation for sin. The humanity, the suffering, the death of Jesus, it was all essential for Him to save us. The suffering of Jesus, it was no accident of history. It was no plan gone wrong. It was the eternal purpose of God. It was necessary, vitally essential. See, He had to come low. He had to come very low to the lowest depths of creaturely humanity if He was, in fact, going to save human beings like us. And so now as we close, what are we to make of these things? What is our right and appropriate response? Well, as we find repeatedly in Hebrews, the response is set out for us in very simple terms. We are, the text tells us, to consider Christ. This is what happens again and again in Hebrews. The writer sets out for us what we are to do in response to the truth he has given us. We, therefore, let us do something. Sometimes those responses actually... Uh, cross the chapter division. You'll notice that's the case here, and it was the case last week as well. Worth just saying as a side note that the chapter divisions in the Scriptures, they were put in later as a, as a help to us in navigating the Scriptures, but they're not original to the text. And here, our exhortation and our response, it, be, it comes at the beginning of chapter 3, and we could hardly miss it. Verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. I think that very often when we come to study the Bible or to hear sermons, we often want a kind of quick how-to message. You know, tell me how to reduce stress in my life in three easy steps. I'm stressed out. Help me out with my stress. Or tell me how to improve my marriage in five easy steps in the week ahead. You know, how can I do this? How can I do that? And the kind of application that Hebrews gives us here, I think it can sound a little bit flat to our ears, even a little bit disappointing. Just like last week where the application was chapter 2, pay closer attention to what we've heard from Jesus at the beginning of chapter 2. Well, this week it is consider Jesus, and it sounds so simple. But you know, the more I reflect on these applications that Hebrews gives us, the applications that the Scripture sets out for this truth, the more profound I actually find they are, and the more urgently I feel we need to hear them and heed them. See, as we reflect upon it, the most urgent need of the human heart is not to find three easy steps to reduce stress in my life or five easy steps to make my marriage better in the week ahead. The biggest need of my heart and of your heart is actually to see Jesus Christ more clearly and to delight in Him all the more. That's the big thing. See, the greater that Jesus Christ becomes for me, the more everything else in my life falls into place and makes sense and begins to work properly. 
And so rather than starting by trying to fix all our practical problems, and remember the first readers of this letter, they lived in a fallen world too. They were sinful people, and they faced the kind of problems that we face today. But the writer doesn't start with the practicalities. He starts by renewing and expanding our vision of Jesus Christ. He starts by telling us and showing us with the eyes of faith that God, the eternal Son, humbled Himself and became low. He became human. He suffered, and He died as a human being. He entered His creation in this most awe-inspiring way, and He did it that He might lead us to glory. He did it that He might enable us to pursue and enjoy the fullness of our created humanity. God made us for glory. That's what the Scriptures teach us. He made us for purpose. He made us with dignity. Now, we've squandered so much of that in the fall, but Jesus has come that He might raise us up, that He might raise us to glory, and He did that by becoming low. He came low that He might defeat that great enemy, death itself. He came low the, the profound sadness that hangs like a dark cloud over life here on this earth. He came low that He might rescue us and release us from it. He came low that He might qualify to be our great high priest, that He might make that offering for sin, that He might know our trials, our testing, our suffering, and that He might be merciful and faithful to us. And what the writer calls us to do is simply to think on Him, to consider deeply what it meant for the eternal Son of God to take on frail flesh and die. If you're feeling a little stale in your spiritual life, things have grown a little bit cool, why not spend some time this week just thinking about the fact that Jesus Christ came so low and did so that He might raise you up. If you've never really engaged with the truth of the gospel, if you've never really grappled with the claims of the Bible, we're just so glad you're here doing that very thing. Why not go away and consider this core claim, this core truth, that in Jesus Christ, God became man and did so that He might save you. Friends, I don't know what joys and challenges you may be walking through in the days ahead. But let me invite you as you return to those things again, let me invite you to go from here simply considering Jesus, thinking on Him, giving thanks for Him, rejoicing in Him, trusting in Him. Jonathan Griffiths, wrapping up our message today called Leading Many to Glory, taking a look at what it meant for Jesus to become human and all that he accomplished by doing so. Our message is from a series called So Great a Salvation, where we're taking a look at the book of Hebrews. And if you ever miss one of the broadcasts in this series, you can always come to our website and listen online. The website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is able to stay on the station each day because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you this beautiful devotional book called Daily Readings from All Four Gospels. It's from J.C. Ryle. And uh, Jonathan, that's a name that probably not all of us are familiar with. So tell me a little bit about J.C. Ryle and his writings. Well, yeah, this isn't uh, a recently written book. In fact, the author has been in heaven for some time. J.C. Ryle is uh, a hero of evangelical history. He was actually a bishop in the Church of England in the 19th century, but he led the cause for gospel ministry and for sticking to the Word of God in his time and in, in his place. And his writings have really stood the test of time. His work on the Gospels are just treasures uh, for us to explore in our day. And in this particular volume, some of his teaching on the Gospels has been broken down into daily chunks for us to feed on as we open up the Word of God. And I think that as you do that, you will see why it is we still read J.C. Ryle more than a century after he put pen to paper. Well, we would love to send you a copy of this book from J.C. Ryle. Again, it's called Daily Readings from All Four Gospels. Our thank you as you give a gift to support. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 
888-998-7884. That might be easier to remember as 833-99-TRUTH. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for listening and your support. Hope you'll join us again next time.